Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, for those of you who routinely geek out here on the channel, you know we have been spending an inordinate amount of time discussing the NRA lately, and I have been accused by some of being an NRA hater, and I would like the record to reflect that I have never expressed any personal views about the NRA, but my viewers most certainly have. Now, the criticism all stemmed from NRA's rather late arrival at the party as it relates to trying to get injunctive relief against the pistol brace rule. There were three other organizations, Firearms Policy Coalition, Gun Owners of America, and the Second Amendment Foundation found no problem getting relief for their members, but it was the Johnny-come-lately of the NRA that was recently rejected by the same court that had granted injunctive relief for Second Amendment foundations. That has led the NRA to finally file a lawsuit on behalf of its members. So let's talk about that. Let's go through the pleadings and let's get everyone up to speed. So today, let's spend a few minutes and talk about Better late than never, the NRA files suit to stop ATF's pistol brace rule. Okay, so the case we're talking about, a brand new case filed just on July 3rd down in the United States District Court for Northern District of Texas in Dallas. Sound familiar? is the case of NRA versus ATF. Hmm, I wonder what this case is about. This is a case quite similar to three other lawsuits that were previously filed that is asking to throw out ATF's pistol brace rule and in the interim provide injunctive relief for all of the members of the organization. Now, unlike the other lawsuits, which we've talked about over a month ago that had several named plaintiffs, including private individuals and FFLs. Uh, this case, the lone plaintiff in this case is the National Rifle Association. Now, I know that some people think I've been a little overcritical because I think that the lawyering that has happened here and the being asleep at the switch might have cost NRA members something. But listen, I'm not alone because NRA's own attorneys early on in the pleadings have to justify their tardiness as follows. The NRA did not initially file its own lawsuit to avoid burdening the courts with litigation and in reliance on existing precedent indicating plaintiffs in the existing lawsuits would either lose, eliminating any need for the NRA to independently sue, or win by obtaining nationwide relief in validating the final rule. In short, the NRA did not anticipate a court would hold that the final rule could not be enforced as to some gun owners, but could be enforced as to others, with the sole difference being whether those individual gun owners were before the court. Now, did you catch that? They actually said, hey, listen, if they lost, if the plaintiffs lost, well, there's no reason for us to sue because we'll just accept defeat. And if they won, we just kind of figured, well, we'd enjoy the benefits of that victory as well. That, that is exactly what plaintiff's counsel put here. But per the judge's order in denying their joinder into the Second Amendment Foundation's lawsuit, NRA states, because of the unexpected shift in precedent relating to the scope of protection from the final rule and the court's ruling in SAF, the NRA now files this suit seeking to obtain the same protections for its members that the Fifth Circuit in Mock and Judge Boyle in SAF have already found necessary to protect against enforcement of the final rule. So for all of you feverish NRA supporters out there, understand it is not I who claimed that the NRA was incredibly late to the party. It was actually the NRA admitting it in their own pleadings and of course Judge Boyle denying their motion to intervene for that exact reason. Now, listen, I've had an opportunity to go through all of the pleadings, read the initial complaint filed by plaintiff's counsel, and listen, I will give credit where credit is due. The pleadings here are very thorough. They're very well drafted. A large chunk of where the NRA is going as far as where they are attacking this rule from primarily deals with the Administrative Procedures Act, which as we know, in talking about all of the other lawsuits that are currently kicking around as it relates to the pistol brace rule, the APA is a common tool being used by all plaintiffs. So this is a decent strategy in the sense that every other plaintiff is also using the exact same strategy. 
Now, I think the NRA here did an excellent job of creating a good argument, what's called justifiable reliance, which is essentially that the public begins to rely on the expertise of the ATF, and then they suddenly get the rug pulled out from under them. And the NRA here has done a really good job of tracing a very long, long, long history of the ATF communicating in written fashion saying, hey, there's no problem with these pistol braces. Hey, there's no problem with these stabilizing braces. These stabilizing braces are legal. They're fine to buy. And then suddenly one day, nope, all bets are off. So I think that this portion of their complaint is incredibly well drafted. As plaintiffs put it, as a result of the ATF's consistent and long-standing history of classifying stabilizing braces as exempt from NFA registration, millions of law-abiding consumers have purchased or manufactured pistols with stabilizing braces relying on these assurances. Okay, now there are several causes of action, or as you put it in layman's terms, attacks to this rule. So there are many different ways ways that the NRA is trying to skin the cat. They include multiple arguments under the APA, the Administrative Procedure Act, including violation of APA 5 U.S.C. section 7062A. Under the APA, a court shall hold unlawful and set aside agency action, findings, and conclusions found to be arbitrary, capricious, an abuse of discretion, or otherwise not in accordance with the law. And so in their first cause of action, what plaintiff's counsel is arguing, in this case, the ATF has dispensed with countless of its prior determinations and classifications and adopted entirely new approaches and practices with respect to interpreting and implying the statutes it is tasked with enforcing. ATF has failed to provide the required reason explanation for these sweeping and arbitrary policy shifts. So the argument again goes back to, hey, listen, ATF for year after year after year said over and over and over that these braces are just fine. Suddenly they do a complete about face and they have no justification whatsoever for that about face. Now, the second cause of action also comes under the APA, which is that the ATF here was acting in an ultra virus fashion. What is that? That's fancy term for acting outside the scope of their statutory authority. As plaintiff's counsel put it, the final rule conflicts with the plain text of the statute it purports to interpret and implement and therefore is not in accordance with law. Moreover, the final rule represents a conclusive agency action that exceeds its lawful authority and should be invalidated by the court which is exactly how the ATF has in fact been acting for decades now. Now there's a third cause of action under the APA and this one has to do with the fact that, you know, we all had an opportunity to make hundreds of thousands of public comments about the proposed form 4999. Then when the final rule came out, ATF did a complete rewrite, completely changed the concept, completely changed the structure of it never allowing American citizens to publicly comment on that. As plaintiff's counsel put it, in particular, the agency's abandonment of a point-based factoring criteria in its proposed rule, Worksheet 4999, in favor of six-factor balancing tests in its final rule violates the APA's requirement that notice be given of a proposed regulation substance so that the public may comment on the proposal. An agency's notice must adequately frame the subjects for discussion such that the affected party should have anticipated the agency's final course in light of the initial notice. A final cause of action is that under the APA, the ATF now is over-regulating handguns, pistols, which exceeds the scope of the Gun Control Act of 1968 and the National Firearms Act of 1934, both of which happen to be correct. As plaintiff's counsel put it, the final rule imposes regulations on items that plaintiff argues are properly classified as handguns under the Gun Control Act, widely utilized by millions of Americans, and lacking any historical precedent for registration and taxation by the government. The American people have considered the handgun to be the quintessential self-defense weapon. And of course, that last quote comes directly from the Heller opinion. And then the fifth and final cause of action is void for vagueness. That is that this rule is on its face too vague and therefore must be stricken. As plaintiff's counsel put it, 
The final rule adopts vague and arbitrary standards and tests that invite future arbitrary and capricious actions on the part of ATF. Put bluntly, the ATF six-factor test is incomprehensible to the average gun owner. Thus, the provisions within the final rule do not provide sufficient clarity to a person of ordinary intelligence as to which firearms are subject to registration and tax obligations and which firearms are exempt. And then, of course, the relief that they are requesting, similar to the other three lawsuits that we have already covered, which is striking down void ab initio of the rule and in the interim, injunctive relief for all NRA members from enforcement of this rule. The suit was filed July 3rd, just a couple of days ago, in the U.S. District Court in the Northern District of Texas in Dallas. The case, once again, is NRA versus ATF. We will certainly keep you posted. It is better to be late than never arrive, so says the NRA. Listen, in the meantime, if you guys got any questions about this or anything else related to what's left of your Second Amendment rights, you should know how to contact Washington Gun Law by now. But if you don't, that's okay. That information is right down there in the description box. In the meantime, I do want all of you to remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.